Good morning, everyone, to our second session of discernment with Daniel Harmon. For those who weren't with us yesterday, uh, Daniel has spent several years of his career as a full-time pastor in Southern California, emphasizing shared leadership, neighborhood outreach, and community partnerships. Daniel recently stepped into a new role at the Community of Christ Temple in Independence, Missouri, leading the emergence of new spirituality and community center. Daniel is especially passionate about discernment practices for leadership groups, music as a prayer, and exploring new forms of spiritual community. So we welcome back Daniel. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning again, everybody. It's uh, it's good to be good to be back with you today. And for the new faces, it's nice to see you today. Um, so I was talking to Kathy a bit before our session started, um, before folks started to come on, and she said, you know, there was a question about, about discernment that emerged yesterday, and I was like, oh, what's the question? <laughs> she said, oh, the question is, what is discernment? <laughs> and, I, and I thought that was kind of funny, um, but also not funny because um, discernment is naturally kind of an ambiguous term. Um, there's uh, it, it's pretty encompassing of a lot of things. And so it can be tricky to really understand in explicit terms what we're talking about when we say discernment. But I'll try to do kind of some brief refining of how you would define it. And um, the first place I turned as soon as you said that I went to the Sea of Christ website because um, there's a, a resource page on discernment that's just a brief overview in addition to all of the other deeper resources we have on discernment. And even in that, um, discernment is defined in about eight pretty lengthy paragraphs. But if I were to describe discernment in simple terms, from my perspective, discernment is really a process of, of seeking God's guidance and God's will and of gradually making decisions that are aligned with God's will. And if you've read the Doctrine and Covenants 163, section one says these words. Um, and I'm doing this from memory, so hopefully I don't, uh, don't misrepresent anything. But DNC 163.1 from our sacred text in Community of Christ says, Community of Christ, your name given as a divine blessing is your identity and calling. If you will discern and embrace its full meaning, you will not only discover your future, you will become a blessing to the whole creation. And, and to me, those words really help understand the aims that we are seeking when we talk about discernment, um, where we are awakening to God's will, where we are coming to see as God sees and know as God knows, and then work in partnership with God to make decisions about our lives, to make decisions together in community. And so I don't, I don't know if that quite defines it explicitly, but hopefully that's helpful to give a frame of reference when I use the word discernment today um, to kind of give some sense of what we're talking about. And so for those who weren't with us yesterday, um, and for those who were, just so I can kind of recap, yesterday we really explored personal discernment and spiritual practice. Uh, we talked about integrating spiritual practices into our lived experiences as part of the discernment journey. So shaping a way of life in which practices like centering prayer and meditation, dwelling in the word or Lectio Divina and the mission prayer are connected to how we live and move in the world instead of being in their own separate silos of experience. We also yesterday reflected on the concept of spiritual freedom, of letting go of our agendas and opinions and biases so that we can be more fully open to the things that God seeks to reveal in our lives. And we also talked about vulnerability, reflecting on comments from Brene Brown, and we talked about welcoming our full selves into community, about living undivided lives in which the truest and realest versions of who we are are who we bring into life and bring into relationship with others. So I'm gonna share my screen if I can find the right button here. And this is a statement that I made yesterday that I would like to bring to our attention again that I think is really important as we begin to explore 
discernment in community. Welcoming our own souls is the first step in welcoming God and others into our lives. Welcoming our own souls is the first step in welcoming God and others into our lives. And I truly believe these words that if we truly want to be open to God, if we truly want to be open in relationship with others, then we first have to be open with ourselves. And that's not always easy to do, um, but it is of the utmost significance if we seek to be authentic in our walk with God, our walk with neighbors, our walk with those who we call community. So I'd like to share another original song today to kind of be part of our centering. And the song is another one that I've written and it's called What We Need Is Here. And the words to this song are actually drawn from a poem um, by one of my favorites, Wendell Berry. And I'd like to read you uh, some brief phrases from that poem right now. Oh my gosh, so <laughs> this is a template slide and it says it's Thomas Merton, but this is by Wendell Berry. What we need is here. And we pray not for new earth or heaven, but to be quiet and heart and an eye clear. What we need is here. And so the words to the song that was born from this poem are these. We are light, we are love, we are real, we're enough. And if we choose to draw near, what we need will be here. So I am going to pick up my guitar now, and I want to do another quick just sound confirmation. Can everybody hear the guitar okay? Give me a thumbs up if you can. Awesome. And I'm going to lead us through this song and invite you to, to listen and hear these words and hear this music. Um, and if you feel led as you learn how it goes, I invite you to sing as well. Um, but my prayer for us is that this can be a meaningful way for us to welcome Welcome each other into community today, knowing that what we need is here. We are light, we 
your love We, we are real We're enough And if we choose to draw What we need will be What we need is here. What a revolutionary countercultural notion in our very consumeristic world where we're always reaching and waiting for the next thing. The idea that what we need is already here is revolutionary. And today in our conversation, we are exploring discernment in community. And I think it's important that before we ask why discernment in community, that first we ask the simple question, why community? And I'd like to begin by pointing our attention to some words from Thomas Merton about living a contemplative, discerning life. These are the words that he says. He says that even when we come to live a contemplative life, the love of others and openness to others remain as in the active life, the condition for living a fruitful inner life of thought and love. The love of others is a stimulus to interior life, not a danger to it, as some mistakenly believe. In other words, relationships and community are that stimulus to our interior lives. In community, more so than when we are alone, we are able to experience love and companionship, compassion, challenge, growth, and the movement of God. And so I want to create a moment of sharing right now for us as a group um, to ask if anybody has a reflection on what you value most about community. Um, and so if you'd like to share a thought out loud about what you really value about community, you can raise your hand and I will try to point to you and uh, invite you to share and unmute yourself. Um, or if you're more comfortable, you can type in the chat. But what do you value about community? Louise. Well, to me, there's nothing like the community of Christ. Uh, there's a lot of sharing. We feel like a family. Mm. So to me, it's the church. Yeah. Amen. Kathy. Growth. I, I grow when I'm in community, when I'm by myself. Not so much. I mean, I can... I still have to reach out to others through books. I still have to reach out to others through podcasts. I still have to, that's all community. I can't grow just on my own. Yeah, understood. Daryl says, the joy of building closer and new relationships with folks. Yeah, certainly a blessing of community. Mary Jean. The collective intelligence. Hmm. Yeah. Catherine says skills and talents of our community members. I love that. Other reflections. What what do we value about community? I like to think it's a big part of the reason why we're here today. Uh, Louise, I see your hand again. It's the sharing as a group. I get so much 
of that because we all have our experience and uh, helps me a lot. Yeah. Catherine says dedication to a cause. Yeah. Certainly that that work of making the world a better place of in, of uh, investing in peacemaking and justice building. Um, being able to do that work with others certainly is far more enriching than feeling as if you're doing that work in solitude. And then Susan says, we're able to be vulnerable. Yes, what a gift to feel safe enough to be vulnerable in community. We've been vulnerable with each other even this morning. Susan was sharing some reflections about her life that if she didn't feel safe and like she could be vulnerable with us, I know we wouldn't have heard those things, but I'm grateful for that level of trust in the community. So there's another important value that I want to name in community, and this is this is drawn from discovering a deep self truth. Um, and I want to share just a really brief statement, which is this. I don't see things as they really are. I don't see things as they really are. So I was at a session um, a couple of years ago for a program called Dynamic Dialogue, um, which was a training that I did through the Bread of Life Spiritual Center in Sacramento, California. And our facilitator, Gene Holston, said those words to us. I don't see things as they really are. We all have our own lens through which we see the world that is different. My lens is different than Kathy's lens is different than Claire's lens is different than Louise's and Anne's and Tina's lens. Our lenses are all different. And those lenses are created by our circles of friends, by our family experiences, by the places we've lived and work, the sources where we get our information, et cetera, et cetera. And only by coming in community with the willingness to say up front, I don't see things the way they really are can we even begin to enter the work of communal discernment? Because by understanding that I need people who don't think like me or look like me or act like me in community is the only way that I can see the world more clearly. It's the only way that I can encounter God's movement in the world more fully. I actually believe that we are currently in the wake of a new wave of leadership in our world, particularly in the Western world, where the days of strong, strong willed leaders who say more and listen less are fading. And I believe that in our present culture and both the realm of spiritual community, but also in private sector, corporate and business community, the deep listening, empathy, self awareness and commitment to reflection are emerging as key leadership attributes. I know very few people who desire to be led by someone who already thinks they know everything. Most people feel drawn to leaders who take the time to listen to each person in the room. Those who recognize that they don't always see things as they really are. I want to name the discernment in community, almost more so the discernment in our own personal lives is a difficult topic because the needs of discernment are very contextual. And they vary greatly when we're talking about the context of a whole congregation or a leadership team or a spirituality group or other forms of community. And to begin talking about discernment in community, I want to return to some words that we shared from Carolyn Brock yesterday. Um, she said in this statement on discernment from our website that discernment is an ongoing process, a stance towards life. A discerning disciple has the attitude or intention to seek the presence, wisdom, and compassion of the spirit at all times and in all dimensions of life. So it's important to remember that even in community, discernment is a posture and a way of being. And it's easy to fall into the temptation of believing that discernment is just a tool that we can apply to our community problems that's going to help us get rid of those problems and achieve our goals and find solutions to all these things that we've already thought of. And so I was thinking about a few examples of this um, as I was putting together my notes and thinking about the sessions of the ways that we may misuse a discernment process. 
So one example would be a congregational leadership team um, that decides they want to hold a discernment process to figure out how to grow their congregation. Another might be a youth ministry team that wants to discern how to engage more youth in their programming. Another might be a spiritual community that's facing conflict within the group and decides that they want to engage in a discernment process to resolve that conflict. So in each of these scenarios, we're not really talking about genuine discernment. We're talking about problem solving. And in all of these cases, the desired end result is already predetermined. So what we're recognizing is that when we know what we want, there's little openness to God's agency and will, unless it aligns with what it is that we're already thinking. And even though growing our faith communities and engaging young people and resolving conflict are all really important aims, there are aims and they're not necessarily aligned with God's will and unfolding movement in community. And because of this, we find ourselves shaping God's identity and even our perception of God's movement around our own goals and desires. So when we recognize this, when we have the self-reflection to know that our perspectives are informing our interpretation of the Spirit's movement, that even in community, a level of spiritual freedom is required to truly be open to how God is leading. It's also important to know that discernment in community doesn't just mean the generation of new ideas. We also think that when we come together to envision the future together, that we have to be bold and fresh and creative, sometimes compromising our heritage, our values, and the dynamics that are in our community. Mark Branson, who is one of my favorite authors and the writer of this really good book that I'm reading right now that's called Leadership, God's Agency and Disruptions, Confronting Modernity's Wager, he says these words, that discernment is more important than innovation. I'd maybe reframe this a little bit to say that discernment doesn't always lead to innovation. But really what he's getting at is this temptation that we find to draw our attention and discernment to what is attractional, what is trendy, and what is modern. And in some ways it even feels like we have to do this to survive in our present landscape, particularly for those of us who are actively engaged in Christian communities like congregations. As we witness the trends for organized religion continue to display decline, it feels natural and almost imperative to strategize our way into a different future. But discernment is not about numbers. And in the context of Christianity, discernment really isn't even about the institution. It's not even about community of Christ. What discernment is about is partnering with God to do work in the world. This is a whole new lens of what it means to be Christian community. So I'm going to share my screen again and invite us to watch a video from Community of Christ. Um, this is one of a four part series on engaging in discernment processes. And this is about a six minute video. Um, so I am going to display this video for us to watch and then um, I'm gonna invite us into a little bit of time of sharing. Sometimes articulating the question that we are discerning can be the hardest part. We might assume that we know what the question is when on further reflection we discover a deeper question emerging that may surprise us. Sometimes the first question that we begin with in discernment is not actually the question that we are attempting to discern. For example, we might be asking the question, how do we get more people to come into our church building and experience our worship with us? When really upon further reflection, we discover that the question even deeper in us is how do we engage more fully in relationship with people in our community to bring about peace and blessing in all dimensions of life?
Once you've worked at finding an attitude of freedom and you've begun to articulate the question or the issue that is at hand as you're in a process of discernment, it's time now to really begin to gather the relevant information that you need to make an accurate decision. The underlying assumption of gathering relevant data in the process of discernment is that everything is spiritual. Even our moments of research and reason and trying to figure out all of the details that might come into play in a decision, as well as weighing the realities of our own lives, paying attention again to consolation and desolation, those interior movements that speak to us of God's invitation. Begin to think about what important pieces of information do you need to have in order to make an informed and faithful decision. How am I feeling as I imagine myself in any of these choices that are before me? What am I sensing in my body? Uh, what comes up in my imagination as I live into those possibilities that uh, are among the choices that I might be making? The next step in the discernment process, taking it all to prayer, invites us again to rest in the presence of God in the midst of all that we are discovering. Obviously, in any position, in any question of discernment, we are engaged in a time of prayer throughout. We're praying for spiritual freedom. We're praying for the deeper question that is in front of us. And we're praying as we're imagining ourselves in all different kinds of possibilities. But there is also a time of very intentional resting with God in which we, we gather up all that has taken place in our process of discernment up to that point and just hold it loosely and allow ourselves to take time to rest with God without trying to work the issues, without trying to analyze, but simply to sit with God in the possibilities and see um, how you and God might be working together to create something new. helpful practice in my own life for coming to a tentative decision comes from the Ignatian spiritual tradition of prayerfully imagining that a decision has already been made and paying attention to how that feels deep within. There was a time in my life where I was trying to choose between two possible futures with my husband. We took a day each to pay attention to what it would be like if we would have said yes to either decision and allowed ourselves to live in that possibility as if it had already happened. As we paid attention to what that yes meant in either scenario, we began to discover places in us that we hadn't felt before. In seeking confirmation, we spend time holding our tentative decision in prayer. It's easy to think that we've made a decision and want to take that next step and immediately rush to action. But the process of seeking confirmation is also an essential practice of the discernment process. We ask God if this is the most faithful decision that we could possibly make. We bring it to our trusted friends. We bring it to our community. We spend time simply being present with how that reality might unfold within us and around us as that decision is lived out. But the confirmation comes as well in checking to see how congruent it is with your values and your faith decisions that you've made up to now. Does it fit with who you are and what you think God is doing in you? Does it fit with what you sense is most needed in the world? Does it fit with your gifts and your talents? 
And when those things begin to converge together, then that helps you make a decision about whether you have actually moved into a space that connects you with God's hope and dream for you and for the world. I hope you found that to be helpful in some way. And again, as I said, that's one in a four part video series. And there's also a, I think it's a 70 page companion resource that goes with that for communities. Um, so if you're part of a congregation or a leadership team or a covenant group or a yoga group or a spiritual community of some kind, and you're interested in engaging in a discernment process, um, that outlined resource that's been created by our spiritual formation team and community of Christ is an incredibly um, well-researched, um, experience-based, open resource for anybody who would like to use it. And I, I can't recommend it enough. Um, and beyond that, I mean, that's, that's one of the beautiful things about discernment is that there are so many resources at our disposal right now. In addition to our own resources in Community of Christ, I'm reading books all the time, some old and some new. I have this book, Pursuing God's Will Together by Ruth Haley Barton. It's just an incredible book. Um, I have this older book, I think it's from the 70s by John English, Spiritual Intimacy and Community an Ignatian view of the small faith community. Um, this book that I mentioned by Mark Branson and Alan Roxburgh, Leadership, God's Agency and Disruptions. And so there's just an unlimited uh, amount of sources of wisdom that are available to us at this time. And what I often find myself doing that I think is kind of interesting is I will, I'll read a book like one of these and I learn all these new things and I find myself doing essentially the prayer of examine of my leadership experiences. And so I'll read something that really strikes home for me and I'll reflect back on choices I've made and ways that I've led and I'll go, oh, <laughs> if I had done this instead, you know, maybe, maybe the group would have felt more open or maybe we could have avoided this conflict or maybe we could have had a better sense of what God was doing in our midst. Um, and it's really, really powerful to always be introducing ourselves to new resources, to new um, new voices of wisdom that can inform our leadership and the way that we live together in community. But reflecting specifically on that video, um, and again, I want to open us up for a brief time of sharing. I want to go back um, to the first step in the discernment process, which is to articulate an accurate question for discernment. And in the video, they talk about how often we we name a question, and then we find the deeper question that is beneath the surface of that question. And so I want to just see if in the group anybody can reflect on a question they have asked in community before, and then what the deeper question beneath the surface of that question has been. Or maybe there's a question that you're holding in community right now, and there's a deeper question simply from being in the space that is being drawn out for you. Um, so if anybody has reflections, again, you can wave at me and I'll prompt you to share, or you can type in the chat and I'd be glad to read out loud. But any reflections on questions that we hold and the deeper questions that exist beneath the surface? Susan. One of my questions was, once the pandemic's over, where will I worship? Mm. And then that led to, well, what is my ministry? Where is it needed? And then it was, am I following the peaceful Jesus? So <laughs> I've been going around a lot and I've kind of come back to where I was before the pandemic. So it's been a, a journey but I'm still not final, <laughs> but yeah. So the question keeps changing for me. That's a beautiful reflection. And I think it speaks to a truth about discernment, which is that it's, you know, discernment does not lead us to a question that is a destination. Every question eventually leads to another 
question. Um, and that's part of the beauty of embracing the mystery of God and the mystery of faith. Any other reflections? Questions among the questions. I see Amy. We'll do Amy and then Catherine. Um, so a question that I've been holding on to for a while, and it might seem off topic, but it, I swear it is. <laughs> the question that that I've been holding on to for a while is, should I open a bakery mm. um, or a cafe kind of a thing? Um, specifically, my idea has been for like, people who suffer with depression or anxiety um, or anybody looking for just somebody to talk to. Um, and then that video had opened up the idea, well, I don't know if our congregation is open to hosting something like that a couple of days of the week and having like a community cafe, because I know a lot of people who are intimidated by the church, but also they would totally go to a cafe. So. I don't know. It's just been a question since that's something that I know I can do. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's just lots of questions. <laughs> Good. I think the more the more questions that emerge, probably the more faithful in discernment you're actually being. Catherine. Yeah. So since our congregation has sold the building and kept. Amy, I wish we'd known about it sooner because we had the cafe facilities. Um, is how do we keep how do I keep the congregation together? And it felt like it how do we keep people together, especially when a couple of us don't have internet capability to participate by Zoom? And then I asked, okay, what's one of the gaps? And what was one of the strengths of our community? And one of them was scriptures coming together once a month to do a Bible study. I says, well, I would like to do that because it was a strength, but again, that's not my strength. So how do I go forward with trying to build on the strength when it's my weakness? So yesterday I'm cleaning out houses, uh, cleaning up the house, and didn't I find my leading in congregation materials? Mm. And there's the whole package on dwelling in the word. And it gave us some clear guidelines. And I thought, okay, there's something to pray about. There's a guide that has been sitting on my shelf. So I need to go clear some shelves and, and let God make sure that he said to me, go back and read this. Maybe this is where you should be going. So it, it just, and it's not something that every single week, it's just like, it's just been nagging at me. So all of a sudden I was led to open a book and there was a couple of the answers. Mm. Thank you, that's a wonderful reflection. Really, you were paying attention there in a meaningful way. I appreciate that. Anyone else who feels led to share right now? Claire, yes. One of the concerns I've had in recent months is, is trying to get out of my humanness mm -hmm. and wonder what God thinks and what God wants me to do rather than what I want to do. And as I read the mission prayer over and over again, it's sometimes a little frightening mm -hmm. when I read out, God, what do you want me to do for you today? and let go of all my humanness and just let him guide and direct and uh, i'm trying to get over that but it's it's difficult to not continue to be human hmm. yeah we're kind of stuck with our humanity aren't we <laughs> <laughs> amen though that's a good thought i like that well i really appreciate those reflections Hopefully, um, you know, the group is inspired and these are conversations that, that will can you continue to take place and hopefully in whatever forms of community you're in, you can think about, you know, what are some of the questions for us that we're holding as a group? As we are in this time of 
leaving pandemic and re-entering pandemic, we're all holding a lot of questions. Um, and I think it's important to ask ourselves, what is the deeper question beneath the surface? Um, because we often, particularly in times of crisis, we really, really get hung up on the shallow immediate questions. Um, and it takes a lot of work to slow down and go beneath the surface. Um, but I want to share a little bit with you, and I'm going to kind of go through those steps of discernment that were outlined in that video. And I want to, I want to apply that to my experience as a pastor, because I think sometimes we hear these theoretical concepts and they sound really great, but it's not always easy to connect them to tangible lived experience. And so I want to do a little bit of exploration of what I will call our attempt at discernment in orange. And I say, I say attempt because I am no under no illusion that we did it all perfectly in any kind of way. Um, and I'm going to outline um, our process in alignment with those steps in the video, but I am going to admit that there were times that we went out of order from what you see in the video, and we did things a little bit differently. And I think that that's really important to name. Um, I think we need to know that discernment as a process isn't linear or systematic. Um, these are resources that we have created out of our best effort to seek ways of being in deeper relationship with God and each other. God didn't write these processes and then drop them from the sky in our laps. These are simply our best attempts at finding ways to connect with the creator in community. Um, so it's important that we don't become so attached to a particular series of steps that we lose sight of the movement of the spirit. So I'm going to try to explore some of that through my experience being a pastor in Orange, California. So just to give you a brief overview of the Orange congregation, Orange Community of Christ is an active, high-functioning congregation. Um, even prior to my leadership, it's a congregation with a packed congregational schedule, multiple community outreach events, a spread of community partners, and a lot going on. Um, and in most cases for Orange, the answer, even if we didn't have a question, the answer was always to do more. And like many organizations, we measured our success by the magnitude of our output. But when we look at our discernment process, the first step is articulate an accurate question for discernment. And this is a process that we began at a retreat with our leadership team um, in the Orange Congregation. And so we asked ourselves, what methods we needed to implement to sustain our current schedule of ministries and events. That was kind of our first question. Um, we have all these things we're doing and we're struggling to do them. How do we keep doing them? Um, and so as many organizations often do, we began our process by seeking clarity through structural and organizational questions. But as time went on, we began to reflect more on the desires and the holy movements that were beneath those organizational needs. What we recognized was more than a desire to uphold all of those ministries and keep them running in a very organizational way, um, that what we were really seeking to understand was how to have deeper impact with those experiences, how to feel more connected to those experiences. And so the essential question that emerged for us um, which is a very simple question with broad application is, what does it look like for us to go deeper? It felt like we had all these wonderful ministry ideas, but they were operating at the surface level because we didn't have the bandwidth to support them all. So we asked ourselves, what does it look like for us to go deeper? Deeper in relationships with one another, deeper in relationships with our neighbors, deeper in spiritual practices together, deeper in the work of peace, and justice. So step two in the discernment process from that video, gathering relevant data. So here are some of the key things we identified that were realities for our community. We were burnt out and we did not have time to do everything that we wanted to do. We had ministries and connections that were waning because we didn't have that capacity to faithfully support them. Another thing we named that was a truth for ourselves is that we struggled to let go of ministries or commitments because they held meaning and importance in our community. 
So even when we recognized something that we didn't have the capacity for, we struggled to stop doing it because we thought that it was important to keep it going. Another truth for us was that we yearned for more presence and relationship in our neighborhood. Even though we had these neighborhood ministries, we still felt isolated and disconnected. And we also knew that we felt deeply drawn to community work. We felt a desire to strengthen relationships with our existing community partners and interfaith organizations and nonprofits. So that's some of the data that we held. Step three in the process, take it all to prayer. And this is not always the easiest step, but it is an important step. So as a congregation and as a leadership team, we became incredibly intentional about reflecting on the experiences that we were having together in community. So as I've named a contextual reality at Orange is an already full and busy calendar of events. Um, so at the leadership team level and in conversations with the whole congregation, we began to pay attention to how we sensed God moving in the life of our community. We had listening circles, small group conversations where we, where we reflected on what was life giving in all these different areas of congregational life. We reflected in a conversation on worship. We had um, a full conversation on disciples formation, on community outreach, on youth ministry, on all of these different facets of our life together in the community. And then as a leadership team, as we moved through the calendar year and as we were engaged in the work of planning events, in addition to planning the event and talking about the logistics of the event, we'd spend some time asking ourselves what the purpose of those events were. We'd ask if they gave us life, if they had meaning for our community, and if they served the purpose of our essential question in going deeper together. So then step four is making a tentative decision. And some of these events, like I said, did align with our hope of going deeper. And when they did, we would bless those events and we honored their value and we felt a renewed sense of purpose in leading those events. But there were other events that stopped happening or that we changed in nature because over the course of a year or a couple of years, we learned that those ministries didn't give us life as a community. They didn't align with who we felt called to be and they weren't empowering ministry in the congregation. So this is an area where we clearly veered away from the outline discernment model to a certain degree, um, where it says make a tentative decision. We weren't doing that. We were still making decisions all the time, <laughs> but we found ourselves willing to reflect on those decisions and to be intentional in talking about how we were making those decisions. Since we were already engaged in a lot of ministry and we didn't feel like it was the right move for us to stop all of those ministries, to halt the movement of our community to enter into a new discernment process. We instead laid principles of, of discernment over our current schedule of meeting together in ministry. And I think what I draw from that experience is that it's important to remember that however you approach discernment, um, we shouldn't follow a process in such a rigid form that it interrupts our relationships um, in our community and that it interrupts the movement of the spirit because the spirit does not move in rigid ways and we shouldn't move in rigid ways either as we approach discernment in community. So I'm going to pause for a moment because that's a that's a lot to take in. Um, and I want to engage with another concept together, but I also recognize that I explored a very small part of our journey at the orange congregation uh, at a level of about 10,000 feet. Um, so you probably have a lot of uncertainty about what it was that we really did. So I want to just pause for a moment, um, recognizing we don't have a lot of time, but to see if there are any questions that are sitting with the group right now. It's okay if they aren't, but I want to I want to create the space for it. I see Tina's hand. And um, Daniel, this is just amazing stuff, but I think girl, oh, I've experienced one of the biggest obstacles to discernment for community or for group is that I find it's really hard for us to get past our own subconscious bias and beliefs to really invite true spiritual discernment. And I think even God's message has a very hard time coming through limited beliefs. And so it is hard, to, you know, the more people involved in the decision, 
the more bias that's coming up through the discernment process. And it's very hard if different people in the group somehow can't hear the same direction. So personal discernment's beautiful, it's just easier. But group mm -hmm. discernment, and so I think, you know, some of the real emphasis on discernment process is helping people to be empty. Like, don't you find that it's really challenging to get people to drop all their bias, all their preconceived ideas and be empty so they can discern? Have you found that? I think it's impossible. <laughs> I don't think there's a way to do that fully. Um, but I do think it's one of the reasons that discernment in community is important in addition to personal discernment. Um, because we'll find that in personal discernment, our biases are far more welcome. Um, even, even if we think we're letting them go, it's, it's very easy to hold on to them. And, and there are so many layers to this, because in addition to our own personal biases that we bring from our own life experience, we all have shared biases. Like, for example, in the Western church, we still have this belief that as white Christians, we are at the center of the universe. Um, and our neighborhoods and our communities and other organizations and everything that is happening revolves around us. And we would never see it that way or say it that way. But at the same time, there are these underlying unknown sometimes biases that are informing our choices and informing the way that that we see the world. Um, something that Ruth Haley Barton says about discernment and community is that it can never fully be effective unless each person in the group is fully committed to personal spiritual practice and full truth and openness in the group. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to say, but I also, I don't believe that it's truly possible to do that. Um, and yeah, I, what you're holding is a really important question that I don't have the answer for. I don't think there is an answer for it. Um, but I think the best thing we can do as communities um, and as leaders is to try to constantly call our attention to the fact that we are imperfect humans with a lot of bias, um, with perspectives that inform our perceptions of the spirit's movement and that it's important for us to try to engage in practices together that can help us to release some of those things to be more open to the movement of the spirit. Thank you. That's a great, uh, amazing question, Tina. It really gets at the heart of things. I saw Susan's hand too. Thank you, Daniel. I, um, I was part of a book club from a couple of congregations, three actually, met and we went through the book by uh, Ruth Barton discerning God's will together and some of us didn't know each other in the beginning mm. but by the time we got to the end we were truly a covenant community it was I hadn't experienced that before now it was two and a half months and we met on zoom during the pandemic but that book was so powerful. And when we got to the end, although we all had different values, we honored and respected each other's perspective. I, 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 I love that book. And if people want to get a chance to work with it, I, I highly recommend using Discerning God's Will Together by Barton. Yeah, it's a it's a wonderful book. And it, again, points us to the importance of listening. Um, something that a lot of us do, we don't always even recognize it when we enter into conversation or discernment and community. Um, when we're talking about or exploring a topic or a question together, somebody will be sharing their perspective and we're not really listening to them because we're already thinking about what it is that we want to say. Um, as as um, Brene Brown will sometimes say, we want to win the conversation. Um, but good leadership and discernment is about not having there be emphasis on what I need to say, on my truth, on what I think is right, but really deep listening and holy curiosity and a level of incredible openness, but that's not always easy to do. Um, so thank you for bringing that to our attention. I think Rod was gonna ask a question as well. Yes, uh, do any of these four videos address 
what we're just talking about. How do we really work on the biases that, 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 that we have? Yeah, they do talk about that in, I don't remember exactly which one of the four videos, but I know in the companion resource too, um, there are some articles and reflections on um, implicit bias and on trying to be more fully open in community. Because I think, you know, one of the challenges and, you know, Rod, your comment and Tina, your original comment and question really brings this out is uh, we, we read about these things and we have an awareness of them of, oh yeah, well, I don't want to have my personal bias inform my perspective and community and I want to try to be open. But then we go in with this perspective of, well, I am open and nobody else is open. Um, so like I'm, <laughs> you know, what, my perspective is informed by openness and everyone else is rigid, but I'm open. And it's important to always, always be open to the possibility of maybe I'm not as open as I really think I am. Um, we think sometimes just because we've familiarized ourselves with these materials that we are, we are always in the right posture and discernment, but sometimes we find ourselves unintentionally getting dragged back into our own bias. Who do we contact about the videos? How do we, how do we uh, get hold of those? Those videos um, are on the Community of Christ website and on the Community of Christ YouTube channel. Um, and if you wanted to learn more about where they came from or kind of their purpose, Katie Harmon McLaughlin, who is the spiritual formation specialist for Community of Christ was the producer of that video series. Good. All right, I see Susan Scott's hand. So many questions, I love this. Susan. Yes, the alternate Susan this morning. Yeah. Um, I love the uh, what you're talking about, the, the contrast between discernment and problem solving. So mm -hmm. how in that obviously lengthy process that you had to engage in, how did you as a congregation um, recognize when you were leaping towards the problem solving end and out of the discernment model end. Or maybe you were able to stay in discernment the entire time, but people being people, we tend to like the problem solving and, and map out the timelines. I'm just curious to hear you what, you what you would say about that. Sure. Well, and sometimes we can't help but solve problems because we've made a commitment to something that's on the calendar or on the schedule and it just feel, and it feels like it needs to be done. And we're, we kind of are, we're, we're seeking a posture of discernment, but we're also operating in a very, um, very structured human reality. And we find ourselves caught in the tensions of those two things sometimes. Um, so I, like I said, at the very beginning of my exploration about our experience at Orange, we hadn't, we, we made an attempt at a discernment process. When I reflect back on that, there are probably about a million things I would do differently. There are hundreds of times I've, I could have been far more intentional at drawing us back to discernment um, when we instead moved into problem solving and decision making, um, particularly in moments of crisis where there was conflict in the congregation um, or there was an event where some major element changed and we were trying to figure out how to deal with it. Um, we would very often forget to step back and say, you know, what is God's invitation here? And instead we'd say, well, we're really smart, capable people. What do we do? Um, and so I, I, you know, I can't say that I'm an expert at it. Um, I'm not always faithful to it, but I think trying to carry the awareness and be as intentional as we can. And, and like I said earlier too, um, even engaging in some kind of practice of reflecting back on past leadership experiences and saying, what could I have done differently um, is helpful as you look to situations that you may encounter in the future. That's great. Thank Amy. You. One, of, one of the things that's um, more of a secular based description of it, um, terms in psychology, it's called active listening versus, mm -hmm. versus uh, listening or hearing. And so like, you can't help but be human and you have to forgive yourself about that. You, you know, you can't be anything more than human, which is sometimes frustrating. Um, but you have to make that exception for other people, or at least try to make that exception for other people. And so the bit and the best way to do that, if you want to look up and if you want to Google um, active listening, it's about, as you described, listening without uh, the intent to respond, but truly like 
it, it is a way of making yourself vulnerable and it is a way of letting the other person get their say. Um, but really that is how you stay in discernment as best as possible instead of, oh, I've got a good thing for this, you know, mm -hmm. and then you're, as soon as that thought hits your head of, oh, I want to say something immediately after, then it's, you know, not, no longer active listening, but just hearing and listening and waiting to respond instead of waiting to listen. Yeah, discernment is about listening to God and listening to each other. You know, somebody may approach you and say, you know, I'm really, I'm really struggling with writing this sermon. You know, it's my first time writing a sermon and I'm having a hard time. And our response will be, oh, I've done a million sermons. Here's what you need to do. Um, when, the, when the holy curiosity, deep listening, active listening response would be to say, I'm hearing you say that you're having some trouble with this. Can you help me understand more about, you know, some of the questions you're holding, some of the challenges you're facing and coming to really understand the perspective and experience of that person, having a holy curiosity. So that's a really important dynamic of discernment. I appreciate you bringing that up, Amy. I see Susan's hand again. What I like during the last in-person CEM conference and creating connections also do it. It's when we get together and talk with a talking stick. So somebody mm -hmm. will talk and then it gets passed to another person and that person has to paraphrase what the person had said, and then they continue the conversation. So I appreciate, um, and Carrie Richards did a, a lot of that, um, as did Creative Connection. So it was a great practice to, to teach us. Mm. No, that's great. And we, we are in such a fast paced, busy, distracted culture that, I mean, in the whole, we're really bad at listening, um, we're bad at active listening, because we're always thinking about a million other priorities and we have a really hard time being fully present to one another. Um, so all of those kinds of disciplines and exercises are really, really helpful. Um, another concept that I just wanna briefly name, I planned to go into it a little bit deeper, but we're kind of running out of time and this is born. So there's a new resource that will be available in the next couple of weeks um, that I would kind of frame as a discernment tool. Um, and it's gonna be called um living the mission prayer and it's a whole outline process of the mission prayer as a way of life and how you integrate that into personal life and into community life and one principle that is outlined in that resource that's born from conversations with leaders in the western field is what's called the action reflection cycle and what i really love about this principle is that Sometimes I think in discernment, we can get hung up on the theoretical, on sitting with the questions, and, and, and we become so concerned about making the right decision that we don't do anything. And that's really not the purpose of discernment, is to become so in our heads and so theoretical that we become out of touch with the tangible and the practical. But in the action and reflection cycle, as community, as leaders, you make decisions together and you engage in action, but then you always make a point to come back and reflect on what occurred. Um, so as an example, when I was leading as a pastor in Orange, we every year had what was called a peace camp. And this was similar to like vacation Bible school, but it was really centered on principles of peace and peacemaking from Community of Christ and specifically from the Peace Pavilion, which is another ministry of, of Community of Christ. And um, from that, from conversations with families in our neighborhood, we really gleaned that there was desire to start a peace club and have more of a regular weekly or monthly opportunity for kids in the neighborhood to get together and have activities centered around peace. So in our response to that discernment, we acted and we started a peace club and we found that it really did not go very well. <laughs> <laughs> and we had maybe a couple kids. We had some weeks where nobody showed up um, and we continued to stick with it for a while and continued to try it um, and really, really just struggled. And I think sometimes we think, oh, well, that was discerned. So we need to keep doing it because it's the right thing to do. Instead, we acted and then we moved back into reflections. It was a leadership team. We talked about Peace Club and we said, you know, we feel like this is a good thing. 
but it's really not engaging anybody and we don't understand why. Um, and so our response to that was to hold a dinner and pull together parents from the neighborhood and say, can you help us understand, you know, we're leading this peace club. This was born from peace camp, which you and your family participated in. We thought this was something that the community desired. Can you help us understand why this isn't connecting in the neighborhood? And we were a white Christian church in a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood. And this was early in the Trump years. And there was a lot of concern about ICE, um, about being detained. And that's really the truth that was born from one of these parents. They told us, you know, we really like your congregation and, you know, we know that you're really nice people, but we don't trust anybody right now. And we're not going to be dropping our kids off somewhere where we're not going to be with them. You know, we're not going to be engaging in any kind of experience where we have to write down our personal information. And so it's not that we don't value the experience, but we don't live in a place where we feel like we can trust our community. Um, and hearing that was so important for us because it took this theoretical idea of Peace Club and it connected it to the realities of the community around us. And through that, we actually began a new neighborhood ministry called Neighborhood Grill, um, which was all about relationship building, um, a very low entry point neighborhood opportunity where folks could come with their whole families and simply have a meal. And we found a lot more reception to that. People began to come and engage. Some of the families from Peace Camp came and engaged in that event. And we had really, really good connection and conversation. And so action and reflection is about acting and engaging in things that you've discerned, but then coming back to continue that process of discernment to say, what else is emerging? or what isn't working and why, and how do we faithfully move forward from that place? So I am going to recommend that um, when that resource comes out in a couple of weeks, um, the, the mission prayer is a way of life, then I will be sure to send that to Kathy who can maybe then share with this group. Cause I know the mission prayer has come up multiple times in this group as something that really seems to be a powerful tool and practice for folks. So I'm aware of our time and that we're about 10 minutes over and I don't want to keep us too long. I want to wrap us up in the next five minutes or so, but are there any final lingering thoughts or questions from the group that need to be named before we before we close our time together? Uh, yeah, I see Susan's hand. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's a question, Daniel. The spiritual formation and companioning program that's in the States, I'm not sure if that's going to be part of where your um, responsibilities are, but my question is, is it possible to have that program in Canada so people don't have to travel to California? Is, is, is there a way of having it for us Canadians hmm. in Canada to, that's a good question. That's a good question. That'd be a question for, for Katie and the spiritual formation team and also for your mission center president. Um, you know, I think that's a question that really is um, very dependent on capacity and, and resources, but um, I think it's a good question. I, the fact that the curiosity is there is really good. Well, with Zoom, we wouldn't need people to travel to Canada, maybe. So, yeah. Well, yeah, and I know that right now, um, because of the pandemic, the entirety of the spiritual formation program has been occurring online on Zoom. And I don't know what the future holds, if it's going to be fully back in person or if there will be some kind of hybrid offering of both online and in person. Um, I know that the team is in discernment. <laughs> exploring you know what the future might look like for that program because they've learned a lot of things about that during the pandemic kathy i had to unmute there um our congregation of scarborough um if if uh, people are coming tonight to the uh to the service you're going to to see the end of, well, not the end, kind of, I guess, I guess the beginning of something that's that's been happening with us. We did not go through a formal um, time of, uh, of discernment, but I realized that we did go through it. 
uh, our congregation, we had people moving away, mm -hmm. great distances away. Uh, and you'll see tonight, we, we, well, you won't notice it, but I want you to, to realize that we have uh, someone uh, living in the Niagara area. We have someone living in the Halliburton area. We have someone living in the Port Hope area. We have someone living we, all over the province. People moved away from the Scarborough congregation, mm. but they did not leave the congregation, which is, it was the fear people were going to leave. And then our pastor, who was a longtime pastor, was afraid to step down. But our congregation said, no, it's okay. We had to trust. It's okay. We'll see what happens. And he stepped down. And of course, all of our priesthood is all over the province, hours away. And then we had someone step up who lived two hours away from the church to be the pastor and someone mm. who lived an hour away to be the co-pastor. Well, then we trusted in that. We trusted in that, that God had, had helped that happen. And what happens? We have the pandemic. We all go on Zoom. Distance wasn't important anymore. We did not see this coming. We didn't know this was going to happen, but tonight, you're going to see the result of it, that every person that is doing a reading or a prayer are coming from all over the province, nowhere near where our building is still located. And so we just trusted that this would come about and it did. So rather than being a formal discernment process, it, there was definitely a trusting in what God was bringing for us yeah and some and that's a really really wonderful amazing story kathy and sometimes it, it's not about having a clear sense of direction this is where we're going this is how we're moving um but it's in the mystery it's in the questions it's in the liminality being willing to trust that that god is moving with you in some way um, that if you're willing to continue being and committed loving, trusting relationship with one another, that the future will be born in the way that it needs to be born. Um, and that level of trust is is difficult, difficult to find. Um, but all right, I see, we'll do one more question with, uh, with Daryl, question or comment, and then I think from there we should probably wrap up our time. I could go with you all for hours. I'm really, really enjoying this conversation, but I'll point to Daryl now. Um, <clears throat> Daniel, it's not a question, it's a reflection. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of today's session, I was in and out because of my lack of computer skills, but you mentioned <clears throat> that there's a new wave of leadership within the church. And I had to get off my lazy boy chair because I heard that to get in front of my computer and just echo amen to that i worked for the church full time for 20 years and in my last few years uh, met some incredible young adults like your sister like yourself i've listened to you more in these last few days probably in the last uh, times that i worked for the church and i want to express my appreciation daniel to you that um, you are where you are because you need to be there and I, I really hated that video you showed us, mm. only from the perspective of, um, I spent 20 years teaching elementary school, I spent 20 years working for the church, and then I told myself I'm going to take 20 years for myself and be on the farm and do stuff I want to do. And why I disliked that video is I felt the impress of the Holy Spirit thanks to your and the group's conversations these last couple of days. I, and I'm in a quandary <laughs> as to what I, I could be doing. Um, 
I, it's a wonderful opportunity to be alive in this day and age. And I don't want to go so far off the beaten path, which is not a bad path to take time for myself. Uh, like yourself the other day, Daniel, you said you're an introverted extrovert. I think something close to that. And I'm, I hear you completely. I'm stuck now in my introvertedness of wanting time for myself. But I'm sensing God's call to um, take some time to reevaluate. So ultimately, what I'm trying to say, Daniel, is our church is in good hands because God is creating a group of leadership like yourself, your sister, and many, many more, more folks that are willing to expand and take this personal diversity and talk about those things where God is calling us to do. And hopefully we will not get stuck in the pathways we are and reach out. Daniel, you've blessed my life. Keep in touch with us Canadians, because we're going to with you. And um, thank you for your ministry. I appreciate that. Oh, well, Daryl, I really, really appreciate those thoughts and comments. And I, I just want to say that this, the last couple of days have been deeply meaningful for me as well. Um, and I, there's not always this level of res receptivity to conversations about discernment. Um, some people feel a natural resistance to it. And I, I've really sensed a level of desire and hunger in this group to want to explore this and to go deeper with it. And I really appreciate it. Um, and I know Kathy has my contact information. And if anybody wants to talk to me uh, on a deeper level, as I said in my very first session, I am not an expert on discernment, but I am always open to the conversation and would love, love, love to connect with any of you on a deeper level. So please, please, please do not hesitate uh, to work with Kathy to reach out with me if you'd like to connect a little bit deeper. Um, but Kathy, I want to ask Kathy and Scott, I know we're out of time. I had one um, closing video that's a song that I thought I would use as kind of a sending forth blessing. Do I have time to play that, you think? Absolutely. Awesome. Some of you have maybe seen this. This is a video um, born from leading congregations in mission. And it's a it's a song um, co-written by Ron Harmon and Dave Hines that is called um, Risk Something New. Where will you lead me today? And I think it is very fitting and appropriate based on some of the conversations we've been having. Uh, so I hope that you'll you'll enjoy this song. Make some space for dreaming God's future unfolding In unexpected places And old and new faces See with new eyes what could be Where will you lead me today And in everything that comes my way May I be courageous and bold Willing to risk Move out of the old And live into Who I am Lean into the adventure Risk new mission together Giving not in to fear Holding trust ever near Creating what will be with God Where will you lead me today? And in everything that comes my way May I be courageous and bold Willing to risk Move out of the old Live into Who I am Settle into 
unsettledness Holy disruption and mindfulness Falling down and then getting up again Learning what to bring, what to leave Where will you lead me today? And in everything that comes my way May I be courageous and bold Willing to risk, move out of the old Live into who I am Timeless truth Know in our heart, bring clarity and give wisdom apart. What do we find but new insights arise? Life's changed direction, therein the truth lies. Where will you lead me today? And in everything that comes my way. I'd be courageous and bold Willing to risk Move out of the old And live into Who I am Live into Who I am Where will you Thank you very much, Daniel, for a wonderful session to this morning and yesterday. And thank you to everybody for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kathy, for the invitation to be here with you all for reunion. And thanks, Scott, for all your behind the scenes work. And thanks, everyone, for just all the wonderful thoughts you've brought. It's been a great dialogue the last couple of days, and I'm just I'm grateful to each of you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Hope to see you later on.